Um, salut tout le monde. Donc, euh, troisième épisode aujourd'hui avec, euh, avec Tristan et euh, Monsieur Clem de Razio qui a touché beaucoup de choses dans la crosse. Donc, euh, on va parler de ça. Premier épisode qui va être tout en anglais. Si, euh, si vous avez un peu de la misère, vous allez voir les, sur, sûrement des sous-titres sur YouTube, peu importe. Pour activer les sous-titres français, cliquez sur le bouton paramètres ci-dessous. Choisissez français, puis cliquez sur le bouton sous-titres. Mais euh, on va toucher, on va toucher beaucoup avec Clem. Um, so yeah, so Clem, um, I did some research, and you tell me if all this is right in like your roles and all you went through uh, in lacrosse world. Okay, let's, so let's go for right it. now. You are you are assistant GM and assistant coach of the Albany Firewolves Correct. in the NLL. Um, you're also lacrosse director and vice principal of Everest. Correct. <laughs> um, before that, um, with the New England Black Wolves, if I'm not wrong, you started as a video coordinator and a head scout and yep. then transferred to D coordinator. Yep. Um, you also coached and was GM of the Toronto Beaches Junior A, which is where I was able to play because of you. Um, and then you played at Brock where you won, I believe, two or three championships and ended up coaching there where you won a championship too. I, uh, I was lucky enough to play on the team for five years and we won all five years in a row. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Never no mind. big deal. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> and then, uh, I coached for three years, um, and we won one championship in the three years. Yeah. You're better as a player, I guess, huh? Uh, Lee got uh, a lot more parity and, you know, a lot of better coaches and things like that. And um, We actually lost to uh, Eddie Como and McMaster the one year, the first year that we, that I had lost. So it was to yeah. some good coaches and some really good players on that organization that year, that, that school. Right. And then before that, which I learned, I didn't know that you coached junior B and senior A before that. Uh, after Brock, I started, I did uh, a year of junior B with the, at the time, the Markham Ironheads. So the affiliate of, uh, of the Toronto beaches now, um, with Ron Reed. Um, and then from there, uh, I went to senior a lacrosse with the Ajax Pickering Rock. I did a year GMing and coaching there. Um, that's where I actually brought in Mike McKay. I worked with Mike McKay that year, um, who we still work together now going back, I think over a decade. And I did two years of senior a with the Brampton Excelsiors, um, as a head coach. And then I moved over to the beaches when Clarkie, uh, gave me a call. Glenn Clark gave me a call to help out there and it just kind of evolved into being, Uh, the general manager of the organization. Yeah, Glenn Clark, that for people that don't know, that is um, head coach of the Five Wolves and head coach of Team Canada, right? Yeah, he's doing his uh, his second stint as the head coach of Team Canada uh, this September, and he's been a part of that program twice as a coach, and uh, or sorry, three times now as a as a coach, one time as a head coach, and then I think he's played a couple times too in his career. <laughs> How did you guys meet? My last, second last year, I think, my second last year of playing, uh, he sat beside me in the dressing room. We both played for for Ajax. Uh, he oh, came wow. in, you know, and in his last year of playing, uh, and we just kind of met that way and uh, kind of just stayed in touch on and off over the years and then reconnected when he got the job as the head coach of the Beaches. That's kind of cool. What happened? Did did Ajax Ajax last a long time or no? Did that team just fold really quick? Uh, it was around for I'm gonna say three years, and then um, you know I'm, I'm trying I don't know the exact dates of it all, but the Toronto Rock Athletic Center was there, and it was actually kind of my idea um, to move the team to Oakville. Uh, when I talked to the owner at the time, his name is Rob Roach, and you know Rob did a lot for the community and, and that organization. The problem was we were at a bit of a disadvantage because we didn't have a junior A team. 
we didn't have a minor center part of it. You know, like you're up against the Peterborough Lakers Senior A and the Six Nation Chiefs, you know, the, the wagons of, of those organizations. Um, so within the rules and the context, my suggestion was, why don't we go to Oakville? They have a really good Junior B center and the Burlington team. And um, it kind of snowballed into them getting the organization and Ajax making the move to Oakville. And in that, uh, I actually lost my job as the coach doing that um, with the, uh, new reg- the new regime that came in there. Uh, but it worked out arguably for the best for me, I think, uh, long term with when it came to that. And I went back and I started out the year with the New Market Saints just because of where I was living. Uh, and, you know, right before the season started, that's when I got the call for uh, Brampton Senior A. So that's kind of cool, actually. Um, before we really get deep into this, just to make sure that the listeners can like you more and Tristan, um, big, big Canadians fan, uh, we can see the the little, is that like a f- big bottle cap? Like what? Is yeah, that? it's like a massive bottle cap and uh, it's my little Canadian corner there. I, I actually, some of my pictures dropped. We had a bit of a flood, so I lost a couple of pictures off the wall. So I got some work to do to put it back up there in the uh, in the cave down here. Love that. Love to see That's it. That's good stuff. Oh, I got yeah. a nice Guy Lafleur on the floor over there and a picture of the uh, the 93 Stanley Cup champions. So they'll go back up soon. God. The last one, huh? Yeah, last one. Yeah. God, we, God, we miss it. Just playing yeah. on the hard strings uh, of, uh, of the Quebecs, of the Quebec works. <laughs> Were you, um, so do you have like hate for the Nordiques or no? I think when I was younger, when they were existing, yeah, Montreal was always the the rival. But living in Toronto, it was just too easy not to like Toronto. So I think that was the the number one enemy for myself growing up. Uh, I've kind of grown up from that. How, cloud. It's just how yeah, that's crazy. How did you survive? How did you survive in a Toronto area living, liking the Montreal Canadiens? I honestly, it just uh, I liked being the heel as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> always, always bugging guys and you know bugging my buddies who were Leaf fans and every, you know, every time they battled it was always fun uh, at school as a you know 10 year old chirping one another and I just uh, you know if you give it you got to be able to take it and I learned that lesson pretty quick being a Montreal Canadian fan <laughs> yeah God, it's not easy yeah, we're kind of kind of not going on the right track right now but I don't know we'll see we'll see how they go um how's um how's Everest going? You guys you guys flying? Yeah, it's uh it's going really well this year um with a full coaching staff of uh Leo Sturos uh who, you know, played NCAA Division 1 for Colgate, played U19 Team Canada field, uh, professional lacrosse player. He actually plays on the Firewolves now. Uh kind of how him and I got connected through through that and through um uh, Brian Cole, who was with us last year, uh, also brought back one of our alumni, Aaron Forrester. Um, so that was kind of a, a treat for me to to work with an athlete again <laughs> on a different level. Uh, and then one of our teachers uh, who also plays on the firewalls, Mike Byrne, has, has been helping out with the program. So um, the, the athletes are pretty, pretty lucky to deal with these three guys. Um, the team is pretty hyped up and ready to go for their spring schedule. Schedule will probably get, come out on Thursday or Friday this week uh, to the public, so JPL can uh, repost it uh, for <laughs> us. And uh, yeah, I mean it's a pretty exciting schedule. And the cool thing about the program now is this will be our second year we're our, we're in an actual league. We're the you know the only Canadian team in a in an American league, um, the MSLA. And it's uh, it's pretty awesome. A lot of people put a lot of hard work in, into that program in that league. And um, you know the the kids get a chance to to play for a championship uh now every year within that so it's a it's a pretty cool opportunity and get some games and we're going to build some rivalries from uh from teams in the league which is cool yeah no it's a decent amount of traveling too right because you don't do you ever play at home or no not really no we haven't played at home in three years now i think um the last time we, we had a home game, and it was against a, a team from BC that came down uh, visiting. True. Um, so that was the last home game we had. So a lot of our game is south of the border, if not 99% of our games um, are usually south of the border. 
Yeah, no. Um, for the um, for the people at home, like you did, that's the great thing with uh, with prep school that kind of all the guys when we did our first podcast, we kind of talked about um, where you will travel a lot and and go to games and miss school, but right, like teachers are are really good with it and kind of setting you up for to have your work and and catch up and all those things. And on those trips, um, we have I don't really know how you call it, but I guess mandatory like homework time or or, or study, whatever study where, yeah yeah where we you have to all sit and, and kind of do your work which is good and i think kind of prepares you to in college when you go to hotels it's the same thing a, we do like yeah exactly like we same leave exactly. Uh, actually we leave tomorrow morning for um for our first game and it's like you miss so much so many classes in two days that you gotta you gotta figure out um time to to do your work so um because I think that's something in Quebec we don't really do. It's like, I at least I remember me in high school when I was playing hockey is like we would miss like one class and like it was the end of the world with the teacher and like we had to like fight the teacher to like leave early or something to get on the bus. Um, that's the one thing I think prep school, at least uh, Everest, does does really well. Um, talking about, we'll, we'll stick with the, the Everest subject. How... How did that thing all started with? Because you kind of, you pretty much built the program from scratch, right? Pretty, pretty much, yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a funny story. It's full circle. Um, there's a, a coach that uh, I used to work with. So I used to coach hockey as well as lacrosse. Um, I, you know, I grew up just like, just like you guys, and uh, playing both. You know, most of my life and. Um, when I finished university, I was back into coaching more hockey um, again as a as a way of working. And I walked into, you know, the school to run a session with um, a gentleman by the name of Dave Demizio. And uh, Dave knew the owners of Everest Academy. It was the first year school just started. And I walked in there and I'm like, oh, you got lacrosse. So who do you have coaching? And the joke was like, well, you know, lacrosse, you're coaching. And I was kind of thrown back by that in the, the 10 minutes of meeting the the owner and, and the ownership group for that matter. Um, and it kind of just snowballed into me doing an interview with the principal and the uh, the owner of the school and, um, you know, saying, what do you think? And, you know, I was working for the school board at the time and I, uh, I thought it was a pretty cool concept that I get to coach sports and and teach at the same time and that's the whole reason i really got into teaching was to do the extracurriculars and i was able to do it all in one and 14 years later i'm still here and still working with the program and just working more on the education side as a vice principal and i mean you and the full you built, circle sorry the, the full circle dave Demizio now works at everest academy 14 years later as one of our again, really? hockey coaches yeah I think I remember him. I used to like yeah, always no, I mean, see him. You, yeah. You, you built something something really, really solid. I think we definitely had weird years with that whole COVID period and, and moving and all that stuff. But uh um I guess now with, with the I like the, the whole like where you're the director and, and you have coaches under you where you kind of I feel like you can I mean, you can probably talk more about that, but I feel like you can now focus more on like the whole like organizing and kind of like money wise. And are, are you still in charge of like team budget or is that one of the coaches? Yeah, I still do budgeting and over, oversee it all, like everything that has to do with the, the program, uh, you know, from recruiting to coaching to budgeting. Um, just making sure that uh, the kids are getting the the best programming possible and, you know, scheduling travel, all that stuff that kind of falls under my umbrella. Um, you know, there's a good support system at the school too that uh, that helps with a lot of that stuff. But yeah, it's uh, it's all encompassing and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. This year has been a different experience for myself taking that step back into just the director role. Um, I'm still out on the field. I was out there on Tuesday. Um, you know, it's hard it's hard to leave that that side of it because you know, there's a lot of passion there and I enjoy working with these athletes and yep. you guys um, were a fun group to work with too. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a it's a it's a cool opportunity and again i still love doing it and that's why i've stuck it out for so many years it's just um where else can you coach some sports during the middle of a school day right i mean that's yeah. um, pretty cool concept and opportunity for not only the players but for myself too yeah no i mean you say that you it's hard to to get out of it when when i was there and tristan was there you would still like throw the gloves on and the helmet on and get out there with us so. <laughs> yeah it was those covid years right just had to keep moving i was, yep. I was lethargic after sitting around for eight ten months in a row there doing nothing so as soon as it got cold outside i needed to run around a little bit and let you guys beat me up a little yeah that was great i mean that was you, always the best practice you were a man up machine though yeah oh, yeah you'd see every little skip lane possible uh, you're you're lying to your viewers you two you're lying to your viewers right now but i i appreciate <laughs> it i really do i know it, it looked great from my angle when i was <laughs> just out there and i think yeah, you and i had more more good. chemistry playing hockey together jay i really do that was yeah that was sick god i'm so mad i couldn't play that game this year because i had to go home that was really good. It was, uh, it's, it's kind of cool. It's, we have, you know, something like 30, 35 athletes come out, like alumni come out to that now. Um, and it's a mix of guys that have graduated last year all the way just eight, nine years ago, which is kind of cool. Um, the eight, nine years ago, guys are slowing down like myself. So <laughs> they're, they're weaning out a little bit, but it's still pretty cool. And I think the kids, the guys like it. You get to see uh, people they don't see that much or only guys they, they see when they play them at the NCAA level or in junior mm -hmm. um, lacrosse. So it, it's a cool day for everyone. It's right around Christmas time, too. So. You know, it's, uh, it's a good time. I mean, our alumni game was, was great. We actually had like, a lot of guys out there, which I guess has been good for the last last few years. Um, yeah. But we should um, we should bring back the like box alumni game though. That was sick. We we need the goalies. It's always the goalies. They don't want to play goalie anymore because they all play out in field for the most part. So we get those goalies back. I mean, I'm down. That'd be fun. Because then you can also hop in. Uh, which I don't know. I don't I don't know if these legs are gonna be able to handle it anymore. Yeah. God damn it. Um. Can you touch, I don't know if it's still possible. I remember, because I'm thinking, but if we have people in Quebec that would like to go to Everest or something, um, right, a lot of them play hockey, kind of like um, you and I did. Tristan, you didn't really play much hockey, right? I never played hockey growing up. I was a football guy. No. Never. True. My mom, didn't let me, my mom didn't let me play hockey. I was a skier. So. Uh, I still right, I still right. brag about Tristan at school every time there's the flag football team I'm like you should have seen this kid from Quebec the best arm and the best she feet was, in the pocket oh, I've yeah. ever seen uh, I mean yeah it, that was fun we should have done that a flag football tournament I remember the I think it was like the year before I got there you guys had one but since it was COVID yeah. I, I would have loved that yeah the team could have used you they, they fell a little short this year they fell a little short in the I think it was really? the finals or semifinals this year, but uh, it's always, it's cool for the school. It's where a lot of our lacrosse guys like jumping in. So, oh yeah, it's another sport that like is just fun to play with the guys. Like you don't need to do like that much, and it's just so fun. Like even here at school, like when we have days off, or like our coach is like, oh, what do you guys want to do for like instead of practicing today? Because you guys have been good all week. We're like flag football or like the turkey bowl too that we do every <laughs> year. Like. Yeah. And all the guys here played high school football and were like all state, all county. And it's, it gets really, really rough. A lot of chirps flying around. <laughs> Building the team come around you. Always. Yeah, team chemistry right there. Um, but yeah, all that to say, um, is it still possible to go to Everest and do hockey and lacrosse? Or is it kind of harder now? Because I know I did that when I came into into the school where I was on the prep team, but there's no prep team anymore. So how do they, how do you guys share the practice time and stuff like that? So twofold answer, they, there is, there's a prep team coming back in September. They've announced there? it. Nice. Yeah, it's Hockey Canada sanctioned. Um, it's being led by Daniel Siska. He's uh, he's doing a great job building that program up. 
Um, so I'm excited to see that again back at the school. Um, so yes, there is a possibility to do both. It, it's getting harder because both schedules are, are getting much thicker um, to do. Uh, you know, always a conversation to be had. You know, we have a player right now that's finishing up his AAA hockey season and we're hoping to have him join us early April and play the spring with us um, and be a contributor for us. So, you know, we always work with that stuff. There's opportunities. If you want to be in the lacrosse program, you could skate once a week, twice a week. Um, these are things that can kind of get worked out, which is uh, which is kind of cool with the program. It's a little bit different than the, the prep schools down south where you have to play one, two or three sports. Um, you know, where you, by high school, we're usually specializing in, you know, that one sport specifically in lacrosse. It's the, it's the prep program at our school. And I remember I had, a I had a great time doing, doing both when I came in. That's kind of one of the reasons actually I was able to learn English so fast. Cause I was, um, I was kind of always with Millsy, right? When we came in and then I joined the hockey team and Millsy wasn't there and I would have to go on those, those trips early in the year. And, um, kind of stuck on my own where I couldn't really say anything, but you know, now we're here and that was we like, do podcasts. That was like English, Sam so. that was at the Hannah's for a month before I got there and mm-hmm. he did not know one word of English and would call me all the time and be like, what does this mean? I'm like, Sam, but it's, it's <laughs> and now you're and, and now you're both doing an English podcast today. Look at that. Hey, eh? that's not right? bad, full circle. Hey, we're yeah. we're learning. Learning. I mean yeah. God. And now I think that's, that's doing one Spanish cool minor. So that's, oh, a Spanish minor too. Spanish Trilingual. Minor. Yeah. Uh, Good for you. I, th- I think that's one of the cool things about sports is uh, you know, language is a, a small hurdle or barrier, but it breaks down pretty quickly uh, once you get going, whatever sport you're playing. And I guess that's a cool thing about our school is we do have you know students coming in from all over the world, um, and we've had that nice pipeline coming in from Quebec um, over the yeah. years. And, you know, they do pretty well with, with that side of it. I mean, yeah, Clem, Clem experienced me being... The first experience was when you texted me for that Junior A draft. And so, I'll, yeah, I'll tell the story. So, it's... Uh, I didn't even know, actually, it was the Junior A draft. And then I get a text. I think it was, like, on the Thursday. The draft was, like, Sunday or something. And I get a text, like, Thursday or something like that. Um from you saying like right we've we're, like we've seen you play blah blah um we're kind of interested in this like can we get on the phone and i had absolutely like no idea what to say i was like if i call this guy i know i'm not going to be able to answer at all so i just like i was like uh, i think i'd rather just text and i remember you were like pushing to really get on the phone to you know get to know me because you're taking a big like a huge bet on me at this point and I was just like, uh, no, it's probably better if I have time to, you know, think about my text and and get it together. But I mean, I guess I guess it ended up being good. But I don't know how. Did you ever, when when you, I was texting you, did you ever was like, screw this, I'm not trying to. No, I mean, skill is skill, right? I, from what I saw and and you know, just talking through it with with our group. Uh, in the beaches that that year it was you know we got a guy here that i think would fit what we're trying to do and he doesn't speak a lick of english but we'll figure that out quickly <laughs> you know all you had to learn was <laughs> pass or shoot right so <laughs> yeah, um that's fair. figured you could you could figure out those two words and you were texting in english too and um it wasn't too broken so we, we figured it out but uh yeah the first time i'm like what this guy doesn't want to get on a phone call i don't understand and then you know as you kind of talk through it with me I'm like oh okay that makes sense um yeah a little bit of that that french english barrier but uh you've done well you've come you've come a long way i'm proud of you guys for for how far you've come with the with the language Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we've, the be- we've been the trying. The Bell family helped a lot. That's oh, that yeah. was the biggest part. Like even if I lived like with Sim and we would like we lived together for two years and we would speak French, like <clears throat> being at the Hannah's first and then being at the Humphreys, like you have to like learn in some sort of way, like how to speak English, just hearing it like all the time, even on TV, on like everything. Like it just becomes like a routine and now like I'm here at school and I call my parents and I don't, I lose my French and my brain starts thinking in English. And I'm like, I have 
when we went back home, I was like, I can't speak French right now. It's it's horrible, but <laughs> I mean, it's definitely better than when I got to Everest. That's for sure. Barely tell now. Looks like you're take straight, that. you sound like you're straight from Long Island now. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's brutal. <laughs> how's, um, how's the season going, Tristan? You guys started last week, right? Yeah, we played um, Sacred Heart on Sunday. <clears throat> we won 17-14. Yeah, 17-14. Um, kind of a rough first half. We were down 10-6, but um, just figured it out as a team, played together and got the win. And uh, this weekend we're prepping for uh, Rutgers, which is a big, big, bigger matchup. So our next two weeks are Rutgers and Penn State at home, which will be will be good. But we're we're very confident in our our group of guys, our older guys. We have like 15, 17 seniors and uh, fifth years that are leading the group, and just all our faith in them, and we we trust them with everything they do, and uh, we truly believe that we can beat both both of those teams, and um, hopefully get ranked after that. I mean. If we don't, be, be just bad. keep going. Exactly. See, see where it takes us. Hopefully, win the CA championship this year. Now that Owen Grant's not at uh, Delaware anymore, that'll help for sure. Yeah, they've uh, they've graduated quite a few seniors in the last two years. Yeah, they still have uh, Mikey Robinson though, and I believe, well, they have the Chioni brothers and JP Ward, so that'll be. That'll be something, but their defense, uh, they lost a lot of guys. So hopefully this year we get to lift up the trophy and get some nice, uh, some nice rings for it. That's uh, I enjoy watching that conference. The the games are always good and the the teams yeah. are so different in terms of style and like the stylistic play is very, very different. So I, I enjoy that conference uh, and those games. Anyone can win any game. Any uh, game. I'd, at the conference uh, championship last year, we played Drexel the, in the semis and Towson played Delaware, which Towson had just beat Delaware to make it to the championship and Drexel had just beat us. So it was like really the top four teams, top five teams even, like it's really anyone can win, which is really fun because it's at the end of the day, you play hard and you're, you're going to win the game, which is, which is always fun. I know it's fun, fun to see the guys have some success. What are you um, playing time wise? What are we, what are we saying here? Just to- um, so for the fall and for the spring, I was on second line midi, and then uh, we played against Lehigh our scrimmage two weeks ago, and I got some ton, not ton, uh, some tendonitis in my foot. So I had to miss like most of, yeah. So I had to miss most of last week. Only practice one by uh, one practice, but I suited up still. Didn't get any playing time, but back in the mix right now. And hopefully uh, once I get my chance on the field, I I take it. And I, I do some good. No turnovers, hopefully. That's all, that's all I'm praying for. <laughs> let the big shot go. Just let that big exactly. shot go, right? Yeah, exactly. So you're hurt right now and kind of... Now I'm good. I, I got some, just some orthotics done and I've been doing some PT every day for like two or three hours and it's, it's been helping a lot. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully I'm good for the game on uh, Saturday and the rest of the season. Yeah. Yeah. We want to, we want to see you out there, man. I want to be out there. I want to... You, you deserve it after all that work. Clem, you ever had any big injuries or you were always a healthy guy, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, nothing crazy. Broke my leg when I was younger. That's that's about as far as we take it, you know, broken thumbs and things Pretty like that. Crazy. We kind of just played through. <laughs> I uh I guess my big my biggest one was my fourth year of, of university. Um I was trying to to get ready for the year, so I was doing all my workouts and stuff um through august and one of my buddies asked me to come play soccer like two weeks before um camp at brock and i'm like oh yeah i'll come play and you know a lot of my buddies that's what they grew up doing we didn't have lacrosse at my high school or anything like that 
and I went out there and I literally my first kick I tried to like just like rainbow kick it or chip it or something like that and my toe caught the ground I went forward I ended up tearing my tibialis and anterior and like I had to go to different specialists so I was out for I don't know almost over half there that season because it's a shorter season and that would have been my my biggest injury I think going to that and I know I was I was devastated because I was so locked in. I was excited. You don't see in your ear, you know, get to get to hopefully be a bigger impact player this year and everything else. But wasn't meant to be that way. And just had to to grind like Tristan was saying to try and get back on the field for uh, the second half. And it all worked out for for the team at the end. There's no such thing as a red a red shirt, right, in the Kufla? Because I guess you don't really have a number of years that you can play so it doesn't really i i don't know that one's always been a bit of, of a loosey thing i think you have to apply it to get grandfathered in you know i'm using the bunny ears here i think once it's after like five or six you have to start proving that you're still in school <laughs> one way or the other <laughs> um i i don't know the exact kufla rules anymore but uh i think the most we had was uh, a guy played six years um i don't think anyone did seven with us yeah, geez. that's the one thing I don't really understand about Kufla though. Like, it's like, well, I guess there's definitely a reason behind it, but it's like, why are we letting those guys play like six, seven years? Like, because then you have kids coming in that are what, like 19, 18, 19, 18, 20, yeah. and then you're going to have this adult <clears throat> that like has a life and like probably a part time job or something that's like Maybe. 26. Like, yeah, I, I played with a couple 26-year-olds uh, in my first couple of years. Um, there's, so the, the reason for it is two reasons. There's Kufla is not a part of uh, U Sports. It's its own sanctioning. Um, so they, they follow their own rules and policy. Um, so that's a, the, the biggest reason is, is Kufla is independent. Um, and then the other side of it is there's no compliance officers to, to track that within Kufla. Right, like the the financing for building up the back end policies and and implementing it isn't the same as the NCAA by any means. Um, so it, it kind of falls a little bit short. So it'd be hard for them as a league to to implement that and track it and you know make sure that everyone's legit with it. Yeah, that's I don't know because I remember even when we like scrimmaged there like those Canadian universities when I was there the fall before COVID hit yeah. and it was like we played Brock and I think their face-off guy was like 26 or something and it's like we we're coming in we had like I think did we have ninth graders that year might have yeah yeah I'm not sure you we did. had that many though but it was like those kids are so old compared to us like we're just these little no muscle like you can't really add any any weight and you're just playing against this adult and i think there's a guy that's like he played pro i don't remember his name yeah like usually, i think he was in the nll yeah there's usually a few that were there i'm trying to think if it was what four years ago for you i mean i think uh, yeah at the time it would have been probably latrell harris was playing there um was he still there i i think he was just finishing that that year um jeff wittig played there he played some pro um i think alex pace played there There, there's a lot of guys that kind of in that time range that were playing bro they had two or three um each year minimum i mean that was when i went there there was like seven or eight guys that were playing pro currently and when i coached um there there were i think three guys that were pro and four or five guys that got drafted you know the year the first year i coached there which was you know pretty cool to see them go through that process I feel like there's still a lot of guys too now the <clears throat> like with Will Johns down and Carlton and um Conley when he got drafted by Albany he was still playing at Trent or uh, was he or was he finishing at Trent no he's, he 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 played his last year this this season yeah, yeah, yeah. so he's he played what two two three years of pro while going there and you know, Curtis Roman Chuck was there as well um right. There's a there was a bunch of guys there that have kind of stopped in and and played. Uh, That's also <laughs> always fun to do, playing against those guys that you watch on TV and that you see got drafted, and you're like, like you said, the ninth graders, like they just go up against guys that like are 
are just playing pro and they they go against the best like every weekend which is always like really fun yeah yeah i mean that's the positive of kufla is you you get that you get that high high end skill of guys that know what it takes to play at the next level or or just breaking through at the at the next level so lots of positives to it too Ian Latrell Harris like guard Greg Palmer when he was like a ninth grader or something. It's uh yeah, it's quite plausible. Yeah. In practice or, I feel or like, against Brock. Yeah, I feel I feel like Lee's have told me that where like you guys scrimmaged Brock and um Latrell was there and it's like Greg three but five and Latrell just like absolutely massive. Because I think he I think they were saying he was it was like his first year in the pros or something and it's just like high difference and and Greg's still tiny but yeah he's, yeah no it's funny he's, he's, he's doing good Greg's doing great you know and there, yeah, there's a guy that that really grinded through and was a much smaller player than most up until grade 12 almost um and you know he always I think you know his mom always posted those pictures of of him and whoever was defending him and it was always a bit of a, a chuckle but I, I think that that created a lot of you know adversity for him that he had to fight through and it's, it's made him the player he is today and you know you guys you've seen his success, success uh, with the beaches and you know at St. Leo he got a lot of honors and and award stuff last year as a freshman um, I'm excited to see how he does this year too yeah no no for sure um but yeah, that that's one thing in general. I think Everest is also fun, where like you get to play those older guys, um, and kind of sometimes you kind of get tossed around a little bit. But right, you kind of understand where where you got to be to to become the that next level player. Um, I guess there's probably more guys going NCAA now than than Kufla, I would say. But I don't really have any stats on that. But just off the top of my head. I, I don't either, but I mean, from a, a team of, let's call it graduating anywhere from 10 to 15 guys a year, um, I'd say it's 10 to 14 guys a year going NCAA now. It's, a, it's a, again, it's, it's all about what the individual wants. I think, you know, for, for you guys and for a lot of the athletes that I work with, there's a mindset around the NCAA and um, they don't look at Kufla or the Canadian universities the same way which I think the Canadian universities are doing such a good job now of trying to create a bit of a, a longer season, you know, with the team. Uh, you go there, it's it's two and a half, three months, and then you're done. Um, so I know a lot of KUFA programs are trying to create workouts and team lifts and, and all those things throughout the year where, you know, the education is fantastic. You get a great education in Canada. There's so many good schools here. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in it, not only because I went there, but you know, I see, I've had friends go through the system and, and teammates and all that. Um, I think the NCAA, the the biggest positive for a young athlete is it, it teaches you a little bit about the lifestyle of, of what it's going to take to be a pro. And it's the workouts every day, whether it be 5 a.m. mornings like you guys are probably doing or, or in the afternoon and being at school all day and being on a team practice and all that stuff. It, it, it teaches you about the grind and the time management and then on top of that you're getting to play against some of the best players in north america um consistently at the at the division one two and three level yeah no for for sure the NC, yeah, ncaa definitely has some advantages to that that's one thing though i wish like junior had which i know is so hard because you know you're in the summer guys have work and and all that stuff but i wish we could have like more of like a team schedule like i feel like it's like you play so many games in such a short amount of time that it's like you barely have any time to practice you're going to practice once maybe twice a week um like team activities you'll have a few but like you know everyone's working and stuff so i feel like it's it sometimes it can be kind of hard to create that that team chemistry that team bonding because it's just like you show up, you go out there, everyone's beat up, but you still got 15 more games to play. You have no time to recover. Um, I know the OJLL is kind of right; they're kind of stuck in like schedule-wise. But I just, I just feel like we could benefit from maybe more of like a, a 
I don't want to say a more organized schedule, but just somewhere where you can have kind of more of a team time and stuff like that. But yeah, I think uh, you know when I when I did work in the organization and I worked at the league level with uh, the other board of governors, you know those conversations were had. It's it's scheduling wise is probably the toughest part about it. You know, you guys are there till middle of May almost. You know, some yeah. schools go till they have that third trimester um, where they go till almost middle of June. And, you know, even if we said, OK, let's start this season May 1st, you know, all your training camp, all your stuff, you guys are away at school and we have to get through a 20 game season plus playoffs plus Cemento Cup. And you have to do that all within a three month time frame, basically, because you guys are going back third week of August, second week of August. And a lot of freshmen have to go back even earlier just to, you know, do the meet and greets and, and the orientation stuff. So it's it's just it's one of those balancing acts. It, it can't be the OHL style model, you know, on the hockey side or the QMHL, you know, for the listeners <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> Um, just because of the, the timelines and even before, you know, I guess what is two years ago now, they're at the whole NLI thing. Um, you couldn't pay athletes. So maybe something True. changes over the next couple of years. Um, I think we need to see the pro level, um, become a little bit more lucrative for athletes before we, we see that. Um, but I can definitely see it happening, um, once, you know, pro lacrosse becomes full-time jobs for, for all the athletes, um i definitely see junior becoming that what you're talking about but you're also going to see guys not go to the ncaa then so um not sure what the right formula is here but i think the right formula is always opportunities for for all true i always i always had this thought i never really understood why especially in the kufla like why didn't we have like a collegiate box league like why did the kufla stick with Field. Was it just because they were trying to, right, kind of get some some of those NCAA players, or I don't know if you even have an answer to that, but no, I I, I actually I don't. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe just field space easier. Um, yeah. It's hard to find a, an arena on most campuses, and the ones that do, they have ice in it, especially in Canada, right? You know, we struggle with <laughs> with getting floor time in the summer because there's been more and more ice and. As this sport, yeah, yeah. as hockey continues to grow, we're uh, we're losing more more floor time because of it. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I guess probably more most school have uh, like football and stuff, so the field's already there, which probably brings them a lot of money already. Um, actually, Tristan, how big how big was football at your high school? Because you guys had a really good team, didn't you? It was it was actually like really big at um, not Everest at uh, Bourget. <clears throat> yeah. It was it was like the number one sport. It was it was also almost like Everest, but in Quebec for football. So we recruited guys from Ontario, from like Quebec City, from all over Montreal because we had oh, we had housing on campus. So. Even I did that. I stayed on campus for um, the year I went there because I lived an hour away and there were just dorms there. So all the athletes and international students that went there stayed there. It was like me and uh, six or seven other football players that were from Ontario and more um, lived a bit further away from school. So we had a, a really, really good football program. Still guys that are getting recruited to to play college football i know one of my buddies he's at duke right now so playing football so it, it was definitely like the biggest sport there football and hockey hockey was also very big now with their new prep team that they just added two or three years ago so yeah big sports school for sure and the facilities also help had had everything you could ask for you ever miss it i definitely miss football but uh, i'm happy with my decision i feel like i i didn't do too bad with uh <laughs> with lacrosse so but of course i miss it it was my first sport and uh i still love it still would like to play again one day but for now uh, i love lacrosse and i i love doing it every day and uh, i wouldn't change it for anything yeah no football's never a sport i really i really got into 
Um, Clem, with the with the beaches, I kind of want to give give the people at home kind of an idea of right the next level and what what they should look for, I guess. But like when you were recruiting and all those things, and you saw us playing, and what what would you say most junior teams are are looking for? I mean, it's a bit of an open-ended question. Every team's probably different, right? I think when you're you're scouting or GMing, you're looking for puzzle pieces. You're looking for you know players that can make an impact, whether it be right away or you know maybe you see something that okay down the road this player is going to do something. Um, specifically, when you know we'll use you as the example uh, here, you know I saw an athlete. Plain and simple. It was just a, a super good athlete that was buzzing up and down the floor, you know, carrying the ball, making good decisions with the ball. Um, you know, that was the the big part of it. So I think, you know, it's position appropriate. You know, we looked at you as a guy that could be a very good transition player for us and play some good defense. And then on top of all that, you were a lefty that took faceoffs. Um, that <laughs> I didn't, I, I hadn't really seen someone do it as dynamic as you with with the left hand to the right hand where you flip your hand so quick and you know smack it out with the butt end of your stick and and you know little tricks like that which i i think caught my eye more than anything but uh yeah i mean when you're looking for that you're looking for people that can make an impact and can can play the game at, at a high speed um and then on the offensive side ultimately if it's someone that could put the ball in the net that's always a a big check mark and someone who sees the floor well and, and works with his teammates well all those things kind of come into it when when you're drafting for junior A, and and on top of that, it's it, you know it's needs. What what does the team need? Um, I know our last year, I you know I tell this story and joke about it sometimes. Our last my last year with the junior A team, we drafted Will and Firth, and you know Trey Deer was still in that draft, and we're sitting there going, oh we like him, he wouldn't be bad, <laughs> and you know we already had a full left side at that point, and so it's like okay let's look let's look for a defender so you know we make decisions on the fly at drafts and you know sometimes it's great to go best available and sometimes you're going with the with the piece that that fits what you're trying to do right then and there or you know two three years down the road based on forecasting right right i'm sure you'd be ready to say that it's pretty much the same thing for right now with the fire wolves right 100 percent. you know you're every year it's, it's different and we've you know learned a lot over each year and each draft and sometimes it is best available like i said and sometimes you're going okay we need that big lefty or we need that big righty uh on offense or we need a big uh, ball moving defenseman or a big stay-at-home defenseman and then we just try and get the best player in those categories that uh that fit the mold of the team and then the reason i tried to call you and we do talk to our draft picks is we got to make sure that uh, they fit what we're going to do and and they got to fit the culture and they need to be good people. So, yeah, yeah. That's the that's the biggest thing that I've also kind of learned here. Where like, it's it's how what what type of player you are, but also what type of person you actually <clears throat> you actually are outside of outside of the sport. Because um, that that's gonna become who's creating that chemistry and those relationships and and more of the the locker room um, atmosphere. I would say. Um, I'd like to get both both uh, opinions on this, and uh, Tristan, you can start to give give me that opinion as a player first. Um, I've answered that question on my page, but what do you guys think the difference is? Let's say we can we can talk about either uh, minor to junior and junior to pro, um, or we can talk like from junior C to junior B to junior A. Um, just kind of talk about what what you guys have seen um that you would say is the the biggest difference so tristan if you want to start kind of a a player point of view i feel like um well i i never played junior c because it was my covid year so i i started off as a second or third year already so i only played junior b but also from watching all you guys play like you sim millsy nate like watching all you guys junior a and when I was junior B, everything just faster. Like junior A is just 
faster. Like, yes, you have better lacrosse players, but you also have better athletes that just know what to do when the ball's in their stick, not in their stick, and they just can can run. And they're not just – I feel like junior B, it's – slower guys sometimes get called up from junior C sometimes like team like rosters too, especially well with us in Genawage, uh our roster changed almost every week. We had guys in and out of the lineup. Some were American, some were Canadian. And it, it was really a uh, like gamble of, all right, who who's going to be on the roster for tonight? Whereas junior A, it's really – more professional and an actual like you said almost like the qj the hockey uh, i'm not a big <laughs> hockey guy so i i don't really know but i feel like it, it resembles that a lot more and almost like nca like the actual like team same roster every week practice together but like all of that where I, we really didn't have that um until maybe a week or two before playoffs i would say Right. Yeah, no, it's I, I definitely get you. You you definitely see that, especially when you're like call ups and stuff. You go play higher and you're like, what the heck is going on? Yeah. Um but yeah, Clemmer, I guess you you have seen all the levels at this point. Yeah, I um, mean yeah, jun junior A is is the fastest, right? They they play really fast, they uh they think very fast. They cover the floor fast. Like everything they do, the ball moves fast. It's uh, it resembles what the pro game is, um, and there's not too many weak weak links on a team uh, at the junior A level. And I think it's just uh, you know over the last couple of years, you've seen even more parity uh, in that league where anyone could win any night. And you look back ten years ago, it it was the four or five teams that would just dominate everyone and um you know that's that's kind of gone away now at the junior a level and I, I think junior b is a bit of an extension of minor in the sense that the good minor programs usually have very strong junior b programs and you, you do see that uh disparity between you know the the standard five six clubs at junior b versus the rest um it's a it's a bit of a, a tweener league uh, where you get the young guys that can't make junior A yet that have been drafted. Um, you get the older guys that either don't want to play junior A and they're just happy, you know, rolling out of their house, driving five minutes to the rink and playing for their hometown. Because a lot of those teams, they, they take care of their players really well too. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in building community through sport. And I think junior B probably does a better job than, than any other of the leagues when it comes to that. Um, because there's a lot of those teams. Uh, junior A is is slowly moving away from that a bit. I think it's becoming more draft heavy and transfer heavy. Don't get me wrong. A lot of those teams have, you know, nine or 10 guys on their roster that are local, but they also have 10, 11, 12 guys from outside of their minor center, whereas the junior B team becomes, you know, heavy community. And then junior C is, is a bit of a mix. It's a it's a great opportunity for development for kids that are coming out of the lower centers, um, you know, like a C D center. Uh, they have that opportunity. Uh, and then it's also a springboard nice into junior B, which uh, seems to be happening more and more. Now uh, you see more kids jump from C to B as opposed to B to A. And I think uh, it'd be nice to see a little bit more alignment between the three leagues and, and working together a little bit more to see, a little bit more streamlining for kids to have that opportunity because you hate when you see a guy get stuck uh, that should be playing at a higher level and wants to play at a higher level, but they just can't because of some of the restrictions in place, whether it's residential or OLA rules or BCLA rules and, and those things. Um, I've heard the pros are not as fast as juniors. Is that because the guys are just old or is it just a different style? Um it's different you know it's uh think of it this way it's a bunch of high school kids going 100 miles a minute and at the pro level it's the top athletes in the world thinking through the game and being very efficient um i think it's All it's right. just it's efficient lacrosse 
Uh, it's very strategical, but it's also the feel of the individual and, and the skill level where guys will move with each other as opposed to just bouncing off the walls. You know, you don't see that one guy that just picks 14 times in a shift. You know, when they pick, they pick with a purpose. And when they play defense, they're out chasing them. And it's only one guy chasing and not all five. And, you know, it's uh, it's just very precise athleticism versus the junior A game where, yes, the speed of the game is there. Um, you see a lot more mistakes in junior A simply because, you know, the skill level is a little bit different than what it is at the pro level. I think that kind of explains the speed difference. <laughs> you sure there's no age in that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, one of our uh, our rookies this year um, raced one of our, our older guys on the team, and we're a pretty young team this year, and the older guy beat the rookie. So I, I'm going to put age aside on this one. Uh, yeah, how should have done uh, that our last year with Colsey? A little race, the boys against Colsey and Shaner. <laughs> See how that went. That would be yeah. hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, how is it to, I guess, build build a team with so many young guys with the Firewolves? Uh, it's obviously been a lot of fun this year. You know, success brings a lot of fun when it comes to it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, hard times last year, like plain and simple. It's not fun losing. Plain, like that's what it comes down to. When you lose, nobody has fun. I don't know anyone that enjoys any sport like that. So with the growing pains of that, uh, it's been nice to see the progress be expedited so quickly. Uh, obviously, we've hit a bit of a, a roadblock right now that we're hoping to uh, get over. Uh, I think we just need Jay to start picking against us again um <laughs> this week on his weekly picks and we'll be okay uh you went 0 for 6 yeah. and then now you've been you've been 0 for 2 since you started picking us so i'm just saying feel free to pick against <laughs> us i'm okay with it um but it, it's been a lot of fun i mean it, it it's different coaching than it is with an older group uh, i've had to learn a lot over the last couple of years working in this league where i've, I've coached guys older than me coach guys younger than me uh, I'm in a position now where everyone's 30 or younger, um, so I got a little bit more age on them, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. The, the The energy is different than any group we've coached, um, whether it be New England or Albany, and uh, the learn experience. It's kind of learn. It's cool to learn with these guys, and they're just such good athletes and they're good guys. I think that's the the best part about this group is they're just they're good people and that goes such a long way and you guys have said it and I've said it now twice it makes a big difference yeah, that that's definitely huge but yeah no my predictions is actually like it's becoming a joke within like my family and my friends at school how just bad they are like it makes no <laughs> sense I get a kick out of it I look at it though every week I check to make sure you know okay good Jay's Jay's picking against us we're in good shape we're in good shape and then <laughs> Thought we were gonna do all it. Right, all right. Thought we were gonna do it. I'm just throwing it out there. You do what you gotta do, you know. But next uh, next weekend, next weekend, I'll start picking against you again. There you, you guys go. are on a break this week, right? Yeah, we have a bye week this weekend. Okay. Uh, weird, weird part of the schedule. We go bye week, game bye week, and then uh, go straight for almost two months here, month and a half. Ouch. When do you guys play uh, uh, against the Riptide at Nassau? Um, it's coming up, I believe. No, at NASA, I think it's in April. I don't have the exact date right now, but I'll try. I'll try and make it. It's like 45 minutes away from school. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah. It's right there. Exactly. Take the train or take the subway, and I'm there in 30, yeah, 30, 45 minutes. April 20th. April 20th. Perfect. So, Saturday night. It's a good time. After a few Americans game. out there. I've been the first Reptide game. We went to see Andy's debut against um, Philly. So we had also McCannell, two alumni. So it was pretty good. We went like nice. 10, 12 guys, mostly Canadians, but we we brought a few Americans and they loved it. They thought it was, I mean, they've never seen it. So it, they definitely enjoyed it a lot and they would, they would go again. Yeah, no, those, those games are really fun, actually. Um, Clem, you want to run through, run us through like uh, the schedule in pro because it's 
so different from right from the other huge um, pro leagues. And I think a lot of people don't really understand how pro lacrosse players kind of live their lives. Um, and you even just, you know, pro pro coach. Um, yeah, kind of run through that, that whole schedule thing and traveling and stuff. Yeah, I mean, every team is a little bit different. Um, some teams do practice midweek. Um, and if they do, it is in uh, Ontario area because the majority of their team is in Ontario. We're, we're quite scattered. We have guys from Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City flying in every weekend. So we like to, we practice Friday nights, um, the night before our game. So we fly everyone in, you know, midday, get them to a practice facility, whether it's at home or on the road, we usually find a spot. Um, we practice at home. We always have a team dinner the night before. Uh, again, building that camaraderie that, you know, we need to build on in a short time. And, uh, you know, fast forward to Saturday morning, we have a shoot around, we do video prior to, uh, everyone gets a bit of a break during the day and then, uh, it's game time that night and you're usually out anywhere between 5:30 and 7:30 in the morning on your flight or in your car ride home, getting back to, you know, your families and, you know, your, your life outside of lacrosse. Um, so it's a, it's a packed weekend. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a cool experience. Uh, it's it's heavy travel though. Is it like that for all teams? You guys, uh, for for all teams, That's I mean, yeah. So it, it depends a team. You know, a team like the Rock, they have a lot of guys that are local. So mm -hmm. I know they practice midweek. Uh, they don't play. They don't practice the night before because uh, teams are sanctioned only one practice a week, and then you know shoot around game Damn. that that night. I think there's about four or five teams that practice midweek and then the rest of us do kind of that, that model I just talked about. And, you know, some teams will practice at eight, nine o'clock at night before a game, just to make sure they get out together. Uh, and even our team's kind of doing something a little bit different. They meet every Monday virtually uh, the players, they do a, a yoga session uh, with yoga Jan. I think Jay, you might've worked nice. with yoga Jan. Um, yes, so they're doing that together this year, which is, which is kind of cool. And, uh, it's again just a way of them seeing each other midweek, and technology is a great thing sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Do um, you have any guys living in Albany, or because I know some teams kind of try to get more people to live in their in those towns, but their cities. Yeah, we have some guys that stay there um, throughout the season, and uh, they you know they help with the in market stuff. They do appearances um, for the organization. You know, whether it be school programs or hospital visits and um, those types of activities to to build the brand in the market. Um, a lot of teams are doing it uh, more and more with guys. And a lot of guys are, you know, on uh, coming out of university with the, the visas where they can get jobs in the U.S. for a year or two. Right. The, you know, the Canadian guys and the American guys that are down there. So try and utilize them as much as possible. Albany's got a pretty cool setup for the players. They got this big house with patio in the back, hot tub. Um, the players get treated pretty good there. Not bad. bad. <laughs> I don't want to stay there for sure. Yeah, God. Um, you guys almost came to Montreal, though, didn't you? When New England was moving? I think it was one of the areas they looked at. Um, but I, it was they, they looked at like a few areas, I think three or four different ones, and uh, they decided on Albany based on a bunch of different factors. Uh, you know, the Montreal thing's always close because you know would have been cool being where the Montreal Canadiens play are close <laughs> to. Uh, but uh, Albany's been been a pretty good setup for us so far, and again trying to build in that market to to make it uh, the thing to do on a, a Friday or Saturday night in Albany. Right. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a good place. We have uh, I want to say one or two players on our team that are are from the area, and uh, they're always always preaching, preaching the city. Um, how? That's kind of a specific question, but does the NFL like how's the paycheck? Is it? And I'm not talking numbers, but like, are you guys paid in American or Canadian dollars? Because the league's all over the continent. U USD. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Right, right. Because I was always like kind of confused because, right, you have it like the teams in Canada make Canadian profit. So it's like, 
how do do they have like let's say the rock when they play their they pay their players do they have to like transfer their money to usd and then pay the players and the staff i i don't know the nuances of each organization i know that when it comes to the salary cap um it's all based on on us money all right that's, that's always pretty, good for the canadian pretty, guys yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they like it, especially the rookie Canadian guys. It's uh, yeah, it's better it's than us right now at school having to pay the exchange the other way around. True. That that one sucks when you see yeah. the when you see the bill coming through your emails and you got a wire. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That, student life. Hey, boy, student tough. life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what's the do you have any idea on the average salary for players or no? Uh, yeah, I do. There's a like a league-wide average that they, they work through. Um, I'm not sure if it's public knowledge, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but it continues to <laughs> continues to rise. I, I, I got to check my contract a lot if I'm talking about it. Um, but it, it continues to raise uh, to, to rise each year, which is which is good and. It's uh, I know the the organizations and the leagues are are working, um, as I mentioned earlier, to make it a, a full time gig for for athletes, and it's getting there. You know, there are more and more guys are are doing it now full time, um, so that's that's a positive. We just it'd be great to get them all doing it. Yeah, no, for sure. It's it's definitely fun to see, and I guess a lot of guys like work for the team too, so that's kind of good where they don't have to have those other um jobs where then that's where i guess there's less traveling and all that stuff if you're a uh, full-time are we thought are we talking like over or under let's say we'll <laughs> say 15 grand uh, how about how about i find out if i can talk to you about it and i'll just send you a note and you can talk about it next time i uh, i don't okay. know what i'm what i'm allowed <laughs> to say and i don't know if it's public knowledge or not Fair enough. I, I don't want to get my Fair wrist enough. slapped here on the JPL podcast, eh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if the league hears about that, I'd be happy if the league hears about this, this <laughs> yeah, podcast you'd be happy. with you. So. <laughs> I'd be fired. You wouldn't want me on here again. So there you go. <laughs> True. That's a good point. <laughs> um, all right. Really, really quick. Field or box? I'm a box guy. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I enjoy field from a coaching perspective. It's uh, more of a chess match. Uh, I think it's changed a lot with speeding the game up. Uh, the shot clock has made it a lot more intriguing and, and everything else. Um, it's become a little bit less of a chess match because of it. But uh, the box game is just, it's such a systematic, fast-paced game where, you know, the adrenaline's going the whole time. There isn't a minute where you're like, sitting back and waiting for something to happen there's always something happening um yeah i'm a box guy through and through (laughs) yeah no i'm i'm for sure the same i just think i just think that like in field you can always have like one or two players that makes such a like a big difference and literally take over a game as like in box you gotta have all five guys really plan together except for your goalie maybe that can kind of make that huge difference but for the rest like one guy can't beat everyone as like you go to field like i know for us last year here like we had the best um fogo in d2 and it was like like he was named mvp of the league like that's how dominant he was and it was just so much easier to have him here right as like box you can you can have the best fogo and the best offensive player and it doesn't mean you're gonna you're gonna win every game so no for sure box yeah and the face-off position is, is changes the game a lot more in the field versus the box. And I, yeah, I don't know if that it, one individual player should affect the game that much, you know, outside of a goaltender, like exactly what you're saying there. So, Tristan, what do you think? Uh, I'm I'm more of a field guy, but <clears throat> that's just uh, I've been used to being on the field with, with football. I like yeah. the more like the agility aspect of it where I can just like dodge and just keep running and just like, and I, I will, I think that if I were to have played probably better box, I would like box better. But like we said, come from Quebec, like I, I played also field high school 
and Quebec growing up like that was the first time I played lacrosse so that's what I kind of got used to and now playing it here in college and at Everest like that was the best going and practice like <laughs> outside like I I love being outside I don't like as much the arena especially in Ganawagi when it gets uh over like 30 35 degrees in there yeah. and I'm that, sweating that all game yeah but definitely love box too for sure or the hot box in Brampton that Jesus. one sucks yeah no that was that was bad or the turtle dome in Equisasne when they packed that out too that that gets pretty pretty warm in there yeah. Sam what do you think's worse the the oven in Burlington or the the one in Brampton that's a tough choice I don't know we've uh oh I, I I think Burlington might be might be warmer just because of the floor sweating like the floor gets so wet there um, especially in like a hot summer day where Brampton has the turf now and that floor was always pretty good in Brampton at, at Memorial but uh yeah I'm gonna have to say the, the Burlington oven might be the one of the hottest rinks when it's just like the air has nowhere to go in there at least Brampton has the doors that open it feels like there's no doors in in Burlington it all just kind of Whirls off the stands, off the back wall, off the stands, hits you in the face <laughs> the whole game. I guess it's also Burlington, like, packs the arena every game. So you're going to have, like, four, five hundred, at, at least in the playoffs last year, it was, like, at least six to seven hundred people in the stands. And it's already warm as hell. And, God, that place is horrible. <laughs> uh, the rivalry, eh? The rivalry between Burlington and the beach. It's built up yeah. over the years. I know, I know. Yeah, didn't you guys beat them as an eight seed before? I I think it was the year before I came. Yeah, we did. It was a uh, it was a big win for for the beaches and and in the league, and that was a lot of fun that season. Yeah, God, because I remember I think some I don't know who was the media person back then, but I, I remember someone made like a hype video about it, and um. When when you actually drafted me, I was like watching that video like every two weeks. I was like, oh my god, this is so sick! Like this place. And then the sandbox was that the sandbox is actually really nice though, with like the people all around and like it's so tiny and you feel like everyone's on top of each other and it's like I don't know. It was a good time. So mad we don't have the blue turf anymore. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know. Ted Reeve. I was asking last year, never got an answer. So Ted, Ted yeah. Reeve will be back this year, from what I hear. So that's that's cool for the players. Yeah. yeah, that's that's huge. That was kind of annoying this year a little bit. We didn't really have a whole home, and it was just kind of it was really weird. And that that floor is so much bigger in uh, in Pickering. Changes the style of play. Very yeah. slippery there too. Oh yeah, you you played there a few times, right? Yeah, in provincial or certain minors. That's like I don't know how, but every single year we would end up playing there against Genawagi in our <laughs> which we played probably four or five times during the year. We go to provincials and we played them and the South and the North Shore. And it was <laughs> it was the worst games. We would slide everywhere. No matter what shoes you were wearing. A lot of foot traffic yeah. with the camps during the day. Yeah, no, the sand, the sandbox is uh, some special. But then you go play in Peterborough, and it's like you have so much room to play with. You have to have no idea what to do with it. So, and the benches. Yeah. Oh my God, those benches. Uh, um. So, just kind of talking future wise now what's what's coming what's the next game for the firewolves what's going with everest what are we what are we saying in the next few weeks uh so with the firewolves we have colorado up next um so it's going to be a big game for us also coming off the the two losses you kind of want to make sure we get back in into the win column so again just making sure that the guys are, are locked and loaded with that we'll try and prepare them as best as possible i know they're doing their thing to prepare for that one. So I'm excited to get back at it. I think that's the 
the best and worst thing for a bye week is you kind of sit there and just watch every other lacrosse game over the weekend and <laughs> okay i'm ready to go let's go let's get back into this uh-huh. um so that's next and then for everest uh they're kicking off their spring schedule going out to bc uh tristan i think you might remember that trip uh, right that was so fun i loved it going yeah. swimming in the in that glacier water yeah brought, brought tristan <laughs> at stanley park there and first got to jump into the water in the middle of march so um we'll uh we'll do that trip again with those guys so we're bringing them out there for four games in over five days which is pretty cool and uh that's gonna kick off their spring schedule and they got a pretty good schedule hopefully uh be on be on the win side of that one too msla yeah. do you guys hopefully. still do you guys still practice in an, uh like a off week or no with the fire we we don't we don't this year um because guys are coming from all over the place it's right. uh it's a lot to coordinate and, and travel and all that fair fair tristan what uh what's the schedule like you guys play saturday yeah so we had practice well we practiced last week had well we had off on monday practice tuesday to sunday since we played on sunday so we had off on monday just rehab and um, treatment with our trainer and then practice from until uh, practice from tuesday to friday so we have uh film at one practice from two to four thirty five every day just going through what they'll do watching a lot of film and especially that they're really different team from last year lost a lot of guys got 15 grad transfers so that that'll definitely be interesting new freshman goalie so and then saturday morning get here at nine get a little walk through get loose go see a trainer and i think our game's at noon and we'll see from there hopefully we win confident without we will win and uh yeah Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be a good game. It's what do you guys really play this game. weekend? Uh, we got we got Wingate this weekend, so we leave tomorrow. Tomorrow, five a.m. Drive to I want to say Virginia, and then it's like practice tomorrow. Um, and then we travel again Friday to get to North Carolina because Wingate's in North Carolina. Um, and then play Saturday, I want to say 12 or something. Um, but yeah, Wingate's going to be, it's one of our uh, top 10 uh, matchups uh, this year. They were ranked, I think, preseason, they were ranked third, something like that. So um, that should that should definitely be interesting. We've had kind of a weird year in a way because, you know, we had coaches changing and uh, and things like that. But I think I think we're still coming coming together. Um, I guess we'll really see this weekend is, is the real test of uh, seeing seeing how we do under pressure and, and all that stuff. How we're, uh, you know, you always have a few freshmen playing, how those guys can can handle the, the pressure of, of season. Uh, but no, should should be fun. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have. Um, I'll, I'll say thank you, Clem. Uh, really, really appreciate you hopping hopping in with us. Um, Good, good luck with with everything Everest stuff. Um, do you have you're gonna have what Everest golf tournament you guys are trying to do? May, May 31st uh, is the plan. We'll have uh, to have the golf tournament. Hopefully, get a bunch of alumni to come back and again use it as a bit of a time to see everyone again and guys to re- reunite and maybe make right. a little bit of money for the program and, and charity as yeah. well. So. And then you still you still do the. The Atticus golf tournament, right? Middle of the summer or something? Yeah, usually in August we, we host the, the Atticus annual golf tournament, um, you know, in, to raise money for Sick Kids Hospital and uh, the Pogo Clinic at South Lake Hospital in Newmarket. Um, my kid was pretty lucky to, to work with both those those hospitals and helped him get to where he is today. And um, very grateful for, for both those places. So try and give back a little bit as a family. And yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Tristan, too, for, for hopping in. Good luck. Uh, rest of the season. We'll, we'll keep following. 
Um, and uh, too. yeah, oh, no, that send me send me what your games are on. I want to watch them too. I want to see all the boys. Probably. Dude, our game this weekend can't even play. Like you have it's some like membership platform or whatever. It's annoying as hell. I don't know. Some some teams in the south do that. It's I think it's like Flow Sport or something. It's like oh, we, eight bucks I have a month. Sport. Yeah, my mom got Flow Sports because like all her games are on that. So I might have to ask right. my mom for the membership. Yeah, no, because like our games are just online. Like I, at least our home game, it's just like right, you get online and hop on the hop on the link. But yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Um, merci à, à tous les gens qui ont écouté. Um, si vous avez uh, des gens que vous voulez qu'on qu qu fasse une interview avec ou quelque chose, um, écrivez, écrivez nous, donnez nous vos opinions, peu importe. Um, so yeah, no, I'll end on that. Uh, you guys are good to go, and uh, we we'll stay in touch, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Good luck this uh, this coming up, James Boys. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys.